insert all your favorite Sabaton memes here. We have reached that episode. It is time for the Charge of the Winged Hussars. It is episode three of the Siege of Vienna from Extra History. I'm ready to dive into this one. If you have not seen the first two episodes of my reaction to this series, there's a link in the description below that will take you back to episode one so you can get caught up. As always, the link is also in the description to the original content creator. Please give them uh, some support by giving them a like. Subscribe. They've got a ton of fantastic history content. I think one of the best history channels on YouTube. I love the way they tell a story. Uh, they do it in nice small chunks, so it's easy to digest if you don't have a lot of time. Let's go ahead and dive into part three of the Siege of Vienna. Each night for a week, a group of artillerymen climb the tower of St. Stephen's Cathedral. There, they fire rocket after rocket, signaling their dire situation to the relief army they hoped was coming. Each day brought them closer to starvation, and each night they fought desperate battles in the moat by light of tar flares. But this night, a sparking rocket answers in the hills. The cavalry has arrived. As the defenders of Vienna fought their desperate defense, Emperor Leopold struggled to cobble together enough allies to relieve the city. Because there was a problem with the Holy Roman Empire. See, it wasn't an empire in the same way the Ottoman Empire was. Leopold couldn't just call up troops. Instead, he had to convince the imperial state that it was in their interest to help him. And that took money. And money was a problem. Because despite their opulence, the Habsburgs were chronically short on cash. To get King John Sobieski of Poland-Lithuania to maintain his treaty obligations, he had to agree to fund the Polish relief force during all its operations outside Poland. And therefore, he was basically tapped out. Luckily, Leopold had an ally, Pope Innocent IX whose pet project was reconquering Catholic territory in Eastern Europe. <laughs> pet, pet project, reconquering Catholic territories. As we've said before, you cannot think of the popes of this time in history the same way you think of the pope today. The pope today is very much a religious leader only. Um, back then, different story. He's a religious leader, but he's also a political leader. He's also a military leader. Uh, he's all of those things in one, and that a lot of that power goes back to the time of Charlemagne. Uh, but that's a story for another day. That was his pet project, really? I mean, some people crochet or bowl or, I don't, you know what, who am I to judge? The Pope poured vast amounts of money into Leopold's war chest, while spinning up a 17th century PR campaign to tout the relief of Vienna as a holy war. A decisive moment in the battle between Christianity and Islam. And this is, again, why I said at the beginning... A lot of times it gets spun that way, right? This is the great war between the forces of Islam and the forces of Christianity. And they're, they're converging on Vienna, which is kind of one of the frontier cities that's right near the border between the two. But it's much more complicated than that, as is everything in history. Never fall into the trap of simplifying history down to black and white because it's always much more nuanced. This is not Islam versus Christianity. They are Christians fighting on the side of the Turkish forces. There are Muslims fighting on the side of the Christian forces. There are many more competing um, interests than just religion here. But not everyone was buying it. After all, Europe was fresh from the horrors of the Thirty Years' War where the Habsburgs had mercilessly slaughtered Protestants. And the biggest skeptic of this campaign was Louis XIV of France, who pointedly ignored the Pope's call to join his new Holy League. Because, <laughs> of course he did. The Habsburgs were Louis's main political rival. He was actually encroaching on their western border. You gotta remember at this time in history that France is one of the great powers of the world. And uh, they're one of the largest uh, countries in Europe. Uh, they've always been kind of a major player on the world stage, at least in Europe. Uh, and so they've always been part of this shifting balance of power. Uh, you've got Spain, the Holy Roman Empire. You've got Poland, Lithuania. You've got the emerging Russian Empire uh, in the East. And, uh, you know, so France is right in the middle of all of this. And so 
they're always looking for angles. They're always looking for opportunities. Oh man, one of my main rivals is in trouble. Why would I help them? This is an opportunity for them to go down a few pegs and therefore for me to come up a few pegs. So of course, Louis's not going to help, but there's nothing in his own self-interest involved. So if they had to redirect troops to the east, huh, good. With France opting out of the Holy League, Leopold turned to the states of the Holy Roman Empire, the ones that would be next if Vienna fell. Bavaria, Franconia, and even Protestant Saxony signed up. But coalition warfare is complicated. Yep. First, these armies need time to form. Second, they moved slow. It was mid-August by the time they marched, and by then, the commanders were riven over the questions that always crop up in coalition warfare. Who would lead? And, you know, we, we say this all the time that when coalitions work, it's impressive because there's so many historical examples of them not working uh, because human beings are involved. And when human beings are involved and when various nations are involved, there are competing interests, there are competing desires, there are egos. And so anytime you see a situation where a coalition works, you have to give a ton of credit to the people who made it work. Leopold wanted to redeem himself after his embarrassing flight from Vienna, but everyone knew that was a bad idea. So Sobieski prevailed. Now, with that decided, who would use which road? Cross which bridge? Enter towns first to gain the honor of the populace? And when they finally met the Ottomans in battle, who would command the right flank? Because everyone knows that role was always given to the most important person. Oh, and cannons. They were dividing all those equally, right? Every move was a conversation. Councils and protocol feasts dragged long. Things only began to shake out when Lorraine, who had just finished turning back an Ottoman reinforcement army... And Lorraine being the guy who we talked about earlier, who had the clothes that were falling apart and the wig that was falling apart, and that's why you kind of see him looking that way. ...only began to shake out when Lorraine, who had just finished turning back an Ottoman reinforcement army, met up with the Holy League command. Likeable and suave, he proved the key ingredient in smoothing ruffled feathers and flattering big egos. He got everyone on the same page. Finally, there was a plan. September 12th, midnight. Inside Vienna, defenders could see bonfires in the woods. The relief army had arrived. And Kara Mustafa knew he'd been betrayed. Reports said Crimean Tartars that were to be his rear guard had not engaged the relief force. But even now, he stubbornly refused to give up Vienna. As he marshaled to meet the Holy League, he kept a large force of his best troops, his janissaries and elite cavalry, in front of the walls. After all, he thought, this Holy League was nothing to fear. His army was large and far better trained. He wouldn't be distracted from the real prize. He would attack the relief force and the city simultaneously. Seems like a bad idea to me. I mean, focus your attack, deal with one problem, then deal with the other. But what do I know? The relief force outnumbered him, but he'd fortified a line of towns that forced the Holy League to attack over bad ground. The terrain favored his light horsemen. Then, at 4 a.m., he began harassing the far end of the Holy League's line. Arrows flew. Long-ranged Janissary muskets coughed dirty smoke. Isn't this an interesting time in history where you still have arrows being used, but you also have guns being used? Uh, there's a kind of cool couple of hundred years in there where the old and the new are still involved. You've got people using firearms, but people still wearing armor. You've got people using arrows, you know. And obviously, you know, we all know in American history, we have that with the Native Americans still using bows and arrows, but many of them also using guns. But uh, fascinating stuff. Kara Mustafa had chosen his moment well. The enemy was still deploying. Their troops not in position and they took the bait. The Germans began moving down from the heights, firing back ragged volleys. Lorraine galloped forward, trying to call them back. The left wing of the Holy League's line had entered battle prematurely, and to his shock, the center was following them. They couldn't move in a solid formation over the rough slope, instead breaking them into little knots of men. Mm. Things were in chaos. In the broken ground around the valley, cut by hills, ridges, and gullies, there was no way to keep command of an entire force. The farmlands that looked like neat fields on the map were in fact vineyards, their trellises providing obstacles that broke up the advance. 
All the while, Ottoman troops rained fire from each village. It's like kind of reminiscent of World War One attacking across no man's land with barbed wire, isn't it? With the, you know, the, the things for the vineyards and everything. Oh man, brutal stuff. The Allied army moved forward in pieces, assaulting the strong points. Ottoman cavalry rushed the gaps in the ranks of the advancing infantry. Holy League artillery unlimbered and opened fire. Cohesion disappeared in both armies. Units fought not in coordination, but as individual companies. Cavalry intermixed with infantry. Dirty smoke blanketed the battlefield, hiding both friend and foe. Fortress towns changed hands in attack and counterattack. Lorraine galloped the line, yelling at the men to close up, trying to keep some semblance of order and seal gaps. The day was sweltering, the hottest anyone could remember. Weapons became hot to the touch, and hours of firing left men's faces blackened from gunpowder. Mm. Sweat drew clear channels through the grime. By noon, the Holy League... Isn't that just... I love that kind of descriptive nature of the battle because we don't think, we're always, when we think of battles, we think of troop movements and this division went here and these men went here and here was where this flank was. But man, it's so much more interesting than that. And that's why I've been trying with my podcast and even with some of my on-site videos to kind of tell the ground level stories, right? Because that's so much more interesting. Instead of just thinking about these big battles, thinking about men on the front lines for hours, their faces blackened with soot, their sweat uh, clearing little sights of it with their, um, you know, as it runs down. That to me tells me so much more about what's happening. It's the middle of September. It's hot. You know, the Turkish troops, the Ottoman troops have been here for months already. There's probably been a lot of disease in the camp and oh, fascinating. Big had captured two major towns and began to press forward toward a high bluff where the banner of the prophet, the symbol of the Ottoman headquarters flew. But where were the Poles? Sobieski's cavalry force had been the last to arrive in the heights of the previous night, making camp in darkness, and had yet to join the battle. In the early afternoon, Holy League infantrymen looked to their right and saw enormous plumes of dust rising above the ridge. The Polish cavalry was making its way, slowly, down to the flat ground where they could let loose. While at Vienna, men defended the wooden palisades they'd erected to cover the gaps in the wall. Ottoman attackers had tried to spring several mines, but desperate sallying parties swamped and defused them at the last minute. Vienna was holding, but only barely. Outside, the armies started to tire, but the League troops were fresh, while the Ottomans were demoralized, having spent two months in yep. the meat grinder of siege warfare and camp diseases. Some of the levies were starting to desert. And then, the Polish heavy cavalry exited the forest. The League's infantry greeted them with cheers. And the winged hussars arrived. Now, it's a bit of a misnomer. This is what we do with history sometimes. We, again, we oversimplify things. The winged hussars actually only made up a small percentage of this cavalry force. Some argue this is the largest cavalry charge in history. I'm not 100% sure that's true. I think there are other contenders for that title. Uh, but the winged hussars are the most famous of the troops, but they are not, this is not a giant charge of just winged hussars. These winged hussars are really fascinating though, and they're really famous. They're considered, you know, some of the elite troops in Europe. And the reason they're called winged hussars, and I'm sure he'll maybe describe that, I don't know, but they had these wings that were on kind of on the back of their horses that, that were there to inspire pride for the men but also fear in their enemies and they had these really long pikes that could like stab two or three men at once and uh it's almost certainly got to be this battle that inspires J.R.R. Tolkien when he is writing about the battle of um not only the siege of Helm's Deep where you have the cavalry arrive at first light and ride down the hill into the enemy but maybe even the battle of Pelennor Fields when you have the 6,000 um horsemen show up and turn the tide of the battle. The winged hussars had finally arrived, ready to smash directly into the enemy camp. But it takes a great deal of time to draw up thousands of cavalry. Lances, horses, and men in plate armor are no good unless they move forward in a block. Sobieski wanted to gauge their effectiveness, so he picked 120 men to charge immediately as a vanguard. Not many would come back, but it could hit the Ottomans before they could mass forces to counter this new threat. The contingent powered forward, wooden wings on the back of their horses clattering, 
frightening the enemy mounts. And at the last moment, their lances dipped, and they plowed into the Ottoman line, carving a hole in their ranks. Dropping their shattered lances, they laid in with long swords and pistols. On the high ground, Kara Mustafa saw the winged hussars strike deep into his ranks. It was over. Once a larger cavalry formed, they could strike into his camp, cut him off from both Vienna and his retreat into Hungary. So, he retired, escaping with the banner of the Prophet and his personal treasury, while dispatching messages for men in the trenches to abandon their positions. He did not want to witness what would come next. The Holy League generals conferred. The infantry had won the day. The only question now was whether to finish the Ottomans or wait until morning. They decided to finish them, and Sobieski would land the killing blow. The king led the vanguard personally. 3,000 winged hussars charged down from the heights, with 15,000 lighter Polish and German cavalry behind. The largest cavalry charge in history seemed to turn the valley black. The lancers crashed into the... Could, can you even try to imagine... Nearly 20,000 cavalry in a charge coming down a hill. My gosh, what a sight that must have been. What you see in uh, Lord of the Rings at the Battle of Pelennor Fields in Return of the King, that big charge, that's 6,000. So we're talking three times that number charging down. And they're not charging into 200,000. They're charging into far, far fewer men than that. Uh, it must have been an incredible sight to see. And it's one of those just all-time historic moments. The rapidly dissolving Turkish defense, then carried on with their four-foot swords. Those behind swung axes and maces, catching anyone unlucky enough to try and cover the army's retreat. This wasn't so much of a fight as it was a rout. The Polish and German cavalry swept through the fleeing Ottomans, plunging into their abandoned camp. And there, they reined in, gorging themselves on the greatest spoils of the campaign. They looted diamonds and gold, and set barrels of gunpowder alight for the sheer relation of watching them explode. Listen, little boys, like I was once many years ago, love to play with things that go boom, love to play with fire. You know, it's just one of those things. And little girls too sometimes. Um, we're just fascinated by that stuff. And so these guys have just won a big battle. Uh, they've got a great victory. Of course, they want to see stuff go boom. I mean, who doesn't? They would loot the Turkish camp for a week. Meanwhile, Jeez. the German units reached the Ottoman trench works, clearing them and taking the remaining Ottoman engineers prisoner. Not quite the same as finding diamonds for a week, but whatever. Vienna had been relieved, and a new alliance formed. Over the next 16 years, this Holy League would strike deep into Eastern Europe, bringing Hungary and part of the Balkans back into the Habsburg sphere. And though no one knew it at the time, the Battle of Vienna would mark the turning point in the Ottoman expansion into Europe paving the way for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Kara Mustafa, for his part, was executed for his failure. Mm. The Habsburgs and Ottomans continued to fight for centuries, each kingdom mirroring the other's decline. And in a final act of irony, which is a story for another time, they would in fact die together, fighting on the same side. They wow, that's a really interesting thought that I hadn't even considered that the Ottomans and the Austro-Hungarians do indeed end up on the same side as central powers in the Great War in 1914. Wow, I didn't even think about that, but that's, that's a cool connection they just made there. Time. They would in fact die together, fighting on the same side. Their interests linked by the same geography they'd created in a war so long ago. A long ago battle, the Siege of Vienna. That was cool. I liked that a lot. That was really interesting. And a lot of you have been making suggestions about the next extra history series you'd like me to do. Probably be after my trip to the UK here that's coming next week. But um, uh, probably going to be the South Sea bubble or uh, the one about uh, Justinian. I haven't decided yet. Maybe I'll throw that up for a vote over on Patreon. But uh, as always, please let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Add to the conversation. Let's learn from each other. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, if you haven't already, check out the podcast. Links are in the description to that or on whatever podcast platform you use. It's called the Vlogging Through History Podcast. Thanks.